great to see so many faces. This is a really, really full room. Good luck finding seats, everyone. Our vision is to give every creator an empowering network because we believe that network is the way that new ideas can come to life, that you can build really exciting and successful businesses or projects. So network is really that core. And there are a few ways that we empower that network. So we have over 5,000 members. It's a curated community. We have people from very different industries and from very different nationalities. And by bringing together this curated community, we encourage diversity of thought, of ways of doing things. And that's a really inspirational environment. Um, so as well as the network, we also have our spaces. Um, for example, we're in one today, a factory Berlin Gerlitzer Park. We've got one more in Berlin, in Mitte, and we also have one in Hamburg, Factory Hammer Brooklyn. As a member, you get access to all of those spaces. Um, we run programs, so we have a few different programs, mentorship programs, um, community-led programs. We also have, um, most recently, our freelancer program called Level Up, which is mentorship and um, kind of a workshop-based program for freelancers who are just starting out. Um, and so as well as our spaces and our programs, we also have events like this one tonight. We have lots of um, social networking events, professional networking, um, and we also have knowledge sharing events, um, things that um, bring experts onto stage to share their insights with you. Um, which leads me on to tonight's panel. So this is the panel discussion, human versus robot, will AI take jobs or create them? Um, a very, very topical. I think that's why it's such a full house tonight. Um, I've done my bit of talking. If you've got anything, any questions, or you want to know anything else about Factory Berlin, I'll be around uh, at the end. After the moderated conversation, there'll also be a Q&A with our panelists, so you can ask some questions. Um, but I'd like to welcome onto the stage um, our speakers for today. So we have Diksha Dutta, who will be our moderator, Magdalena Paluk, who is the founder of Lab Twin, uh, Dominic Lambersby from Texcortex AI, oh, sorry. Um, and I believe we also have Marcel joining us online from Toledo, is that right? Okay, round of applause for our content tonight. Thank you for the introduction and that little exercise which actually taught us that we need human interaction still, AI or no AI. So my name is Diksha. I'm going to moderate this panel today and I'm a podcaster and a marketing consultant, particularly for the Web3 industry. So quick question, um, how many of you used uh, ChatGPT today? Okay, how many of you use it every day? Cool, okay, I, I, I also see some hands are, are not up, great. So we, we are gonna have an exciting conversation. So let's go straight into it. We have three amazing panelists joining us and uh, I'm gonna go with the burning question. So you all are involved with AI and briefly introduce yourself and tell us why is your AI startup relevant in 2023? What problem you're solving? Shall we go? Ladies <laughs> first. Um, Magdalena Paluc, uh, I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of LabTwin. LabTwin is a digital lab assistant. Um, our mission is to actually accelerate drug discovery. So we support scientists in capturing and accessing information in real time. And we do it mostly via voice, but also employ other NLP technologies in order to do that uh, more effectively. Um, what, why, why is it still relative in 2023? We've been in business for four years. Uh, we are a Berlin-based startup. And um, well, it's because drugs still take incredible amount of time to bring to market. I think all of you have experienced this with vaccine, uh, with, with, uh, with COVID vaccine. That was, I think, the most Previous to what public uh, knows about uh, bringing a uh, solution, medical solution to market, but it still takes around seven to 10 years on average to bring um, uh, drugs to market. So I think we can all um, use a little bit more of um, healing powers uh, that scientists can, can deliver and we're there to support it. Okay, would love to know more about it as we go ahead in the panel and Dominic. 
Yeah, I think um, we are one of the youngest companies here today. My co-founder is also somewhere. Sincerely, I cannot see him at the moment. Uh, Text Cortex started two years ago here in the factory. Uh, actually, a little bit previous because my co-founder started running large language models in a small GPU rack under his desk. Uh, ever since we developed a little bit further, uh, I hope that I can convince some of you to use our Xenochat alternative. Uh, what we are doing basically is think about somewhere in between Grammarly and ChatGPT. Uh, last year we've been known as a writing assistant, helping you a lot with rewriting, tone changing, expanding on your thoughts. Uh, ever since the beginning of the year, uh, when we reverse engineered ChatGPT quite briefly and quickly, uh, we are seen as a virtual assistant more or less for whoever is using us. Uh, by today's standards, we help more than a million people. Uh, educating them around the, the, the topic of AI tools, and uh, also them using our tools. We are available as a Chrome extension, Safari, or Safari extension comes soon, web app um, as a desktop app as well, API, and the third product I always love to talk about is education, certainly, because otherwise, uh, if we don't ethically use these new generative AI technologies, such as ChatGPT, uh, we run all into very blind spots into working, and now I stop talking about us. <laughs> no, you're in a hot market, so I'm sure you have a lot to talk about, and I hope by the end of it, some of us will have this in our stack, your tool in our stack. So thank you for the introduction. Hello, Marcel. I can see you here, but people can see you here. So um, yes, cool. waiting for your introduction. Hi, guys. Um, by the way, I cannot see you from here, so I kind of like speak against myself, uh, but I hope that you can see me. Uh, my name is Marcel. I'm founder. Thank you. I'm founder of Taledo and um, Edward Short. Like we digitalize recruiting, and um, you might have a touch point with recruiting either from a candidate side um, or as a company side for hiring talent. And you probably have noticed that this industry is still extremely analog. So we try to digitize that, and yes, we use some AI as well. But I think what makes us special here in this round of panelists is that we use AI um, in addition to also believing that the human component is important. Yeah, so we believe um, that the human industry of recruiting, um, the human touch, remains important. And our mission is to facilitate um, the combination of AI, human touch, and a nice product design. Thank you. Yeah, and you left on a good point because that's what we are here to discuss. Like, mm -hmm. how is AI going to still keep humans relative, uh, relevant and jobs relevant? And Dominic, I visited your website before coming, and it says that it's going to make me 10 times more productive. So does this mean that people are going to lose jobs? Or <laughs> is a product like this going to create more jobs? What would you say to that? Well, first question, could you please raise your hand whoever feels ChatGPT gives them productivity in their daily life? More creativity, yeah, faster respawn times, absolutely. Um, I don't believe that it will take away any jobs. On the other side, we already see jobs like prompt engineers happening now, even though I, th I believe that also will be a, a brief hype. I'm a trained data scientist who also already within five to seven years will get taken by technology more or less. And I think my co-founder always uh, puts that very nicely. It's a term of productivity. Yeah, this, this, these things have given us so much productivity just by the sheer amount of information we can now process as single mind. Yeah, with that new technology and generative AI will be the technology of this decade. Um, we basically also get the capability to process all of that information and to be productive with it, with it to make outputs with it. Yeah, there will be no jobs which will be plainly gone. I am a huge believer that there's also many jobs which make many people very dissatisfied. Uh, and I hope that in particular this Generative AI together with uh, RPA, Robotic Process Automation, will help us a lot in becoming much more efficient organizations and that we all have much more time to do what we like to do. Well, that's the ideal situation, but I'm going to come back to you and ask a counter yes. question on that as well. <laughs> <Through> me. <laughs> so, uh, Mark Delina, you are in an industry where data is like, I mean, data is relevant for all industries, but particularly in science and R&D, it's like, very dear to scientists. So what's been your challenge in acquiring more users and convincing them that AI is good? And tell us a little bit about the user journey that you've had with your product. 
Yeah, it's a great question. So we are a SaaS business, which means most of our customers are enterprise customers. Um, and there, I've, it's true, pharma has been built and evolved on IP. Um, now it's sort of losing, <laughs> maybe in, in danger um, because of, of that. Uh, they call it uh, pharma Armageddon, um, just because a lot of IP actually is expiring um, at this point. So that is driving that industry or has driven that industry for, for a while. And there is, I think, most companies, different levels in a company um, have different openness to bringing AI in, right? If you're speaking to a technical buyer or even a business buyer, they're in a position in the company that they can see, you know, potential of those technologies and can also see what the implications could be and are more bold in and open to bring in this technology, especially if they're working in an IT part of the organization. Now, then we have users, uh, because these stakeholders make decisions, we're bringing a tool in, and then it needs to be adopted. And ad adoption is, I think, where a challenge begins, right? Because the thing is, on a, on a different levels, or lower levels of this organization, especially large organizations, global organizations, users don't know what that means for them. What does it mean for them in day-to-day -day life? What does it mean to them in terms of job security? Um, I think the publicity publicity around AI also doesn't help. So, so to, be, to be very frank, we don't often use the word AI when we speak to customers. Um, and to be honest, I also don't think that we're there yet. We're, n we're not the level of intelligence where I would like to be able to offer, right? We do have machine learning, powerful machine learning um, models that power our product. But at the end, intelligence still resides with the scientists. Um, and I think we, we, we reinforce that um, when, when we get our users on, on board. Uh, but a lot of it is change management. Um, and, you know, ma majority of the public, I mean, majority of people actually, we're not great in changing fast and, and we don't like change. So you have to show benefits to different to users. This is more convenient. You don't have to do extra work. Um, it can save you this much time. It doesn't mean that it will replace you. It just means that you can do so much more now. Um, and I think in, a, in general, like, as I said, it still takes so long to bring this innovation, scientific innovation to market that in many cases, the, there is welcomeness of, can I do things faster? Can I get to results faster? Can I increase the amount of experiments that are successful? Um, and and that, those are the different benefits that users, uh, that we bring to users and reason users see. But there's definitely distinct sort of disparity in terms of knowledge and understanding. What's AI? How is it going to impact me? So I think we all have a responsibility on ed ed educating um, and showing sort of the path. Well, thanks for sharing. And also great to hear the receptiveness to, to adoption. Um, and Marcel, I think recruitment particularly has had, um, you know, me being a person of color born in India, I know that the bias of AI in recruitment is, is a very sensitive topic and it's always had some kind of criticism. And now that this is going to increase in recruitment processes, it processes at, least, at least that's what I assume with AI becoming faster. How do you think the hiring industry is going to deal with this bias that AI brings in recruitment? Yeah, it's a big, big, big question, big topic. Um, so maybe it makes sense to start by thinking um, what is um, what is bias first of all, and um, basically it is um, uh, tendencies of decision making um, that we do in our daily lives. You know that is coming from the culture and the environment and um, our raising up, basically. You know um, that we have in us. So. Essentially, it is um, it is helping us navigating. So this kind of like habits and automational processes helps us navigating um, the day to day life. So these things can also fire back. And then we talk about, um, you know, biases typically, because there we have in mind, we talk about, you know, um, racism or um, gender, all of these topics. And suddenly um, these um, these unconscious decisions, you know, have a drawback on another um, uh, party. So essentially, 
it is um, it is a social problem and it is a society problem. And I think um, what um, what makes AI here um, so so much in the spotlight is that it now becomes just you know faster and more prominent. It's being more spoken about. So with this in mind, I actually think that it is a good thing because even nowadays, think about what are the biases besides you know racism and gender that are not being talked about. Right? This is this is not so easy to answer because it's subconscious, but it's still there. We are all the result of bias, essentially. So I think in this regard, um, it's good that we start talking about these things. And um, this is also how we approach it um, at Taledo by um, telling our clients, you know, that um, um, they should be open, essentially, for any talent. Um, for example, some German clients in uh, the Mittelstand, yeah, so some hidden champions, basically, some of them still require um, German as a language. Um, especially still for developers, for example, where in our case, this is um, a very bad decision because it will lead them to be uh, to have a disadvantage on the market. Right. So uh, we try to basically educate people on that regard. But in the end, it is the human who makes this decision. So now coming back to this like a technical part, um, we follow um, a skill based approach in our matching, which um, we hope is the most neutral that you can take, uh, because it is um, essentially um, a skill, a hard skill. We focus on hard skill as well, so that uh, we uh, we know like um, this is a job requirement and this is something that um, that the candidate brings to the table and, uh, and nothing else. And we don't try to um, to do something, no predictions of what will happen in the interview or nothing. It's simply about um, is this um, um, is this a candidate that you would consider inviting to an interview and everything else that happens afterwards um, we cannot predict um, and we also um, basically put the human component there in again right so this is like where we can adjust it also a bit if we feel like oh well this is uh, this is a decision that is based on wrong fundamentals for example thank you and and i think all of you really had education as one of the you know common common things that you spoke about but i just feel like that's a very long-term game, and I hope we are able to do that step by step. A question that I have for all of you is that you spoke about productivity, and you said, yeah, sure, AI is making our lives very productive, even mine as a marketing person, content person every day. But in the next five to 10 years, what are the jobs that you feel, in your view, are going to go and what are the jobs that you feel are going to arise? I know it's a very like predictable, uh, like more hypothetical question, but but still, I would love to hear views from all of you. Yeah, like I already mentioned, uh, the intersection of AI and RPA as technologies, for example, uh, will be one of the main drivers, for example, to get a lot of administrative work out of the system. I mean, many of our many investors, many customers of ours ask us how many people we are because they believe we have a company of 100 people. We are 14, uh, dispersed over three continents now. Um, but we automate a lot. Yeah, we, we, we came from that space of helping people with creativity, so to say, with AI. Um, yeah, we have a high culture of automating anything anyway and try to create value at all time. So that's, I think we, we're gonna have anyways a, a new form of organization soon, which will be leaner, yeah? but also as you can see that there are more freelancers. I mean, Factory is a great example for that, uh, a community of creators and freelancers basically, who all work on their own time, on their own dreams more or less, and also on what they enjoy. Uh, the reason why I went into that whole topic, why I studied machine learning, etc., was in 2015, one of the major banks in Germany wanted to hire me for one of their digital hubs. Uh, 800 people they wanted to build up there and wanted to let go half of the bank, which would have been around 16,000 people. Uh, that's where I told myself there's going to be a major change, uh, but if we think about which new jobs might be created quite soon, you can see the notion of prompt engineers, many people on TikTok, say how much money they make. Ultimately, it's a different form of, uh, one of our engineers has a great, uh, has the name for it. Um, basically, programming with the English language, with natural language. Uh, also, when I learned programming, if you get started, you, you think about your base logic, you write pseudocode, and then you start Googling or try to learn from communities how you can build your product. Uh, this is now democratized. Each of us is very well capable with CinoChat, uh, as well as GPT-4 or any type of ChatGPT uh, product, 
to be much more creative and start building software products immediately. Or, I mean, in the future, there will be new jobs where my co-founder is obsessed with it, putting large language models into robotics. Google already on their campus has um, 30 robots running around. If you just say, hey, I spilled my drink, what should I do? The large language model insights auto-completes more or less, hey, oh, if you spilled your drink, you most likely want to clean it up, so you need a sponge. Here's a sponge, and by the way, here's a new drink. Uh, that's that's plain logic, uh, which is happening there. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does, and Magdalena will continue <laughs> with her views on this. Yeah, I mean, I think... Part, yeah, of course I agree, and all, all the all the repetitive type jobs um, that that will 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 go away, uh, they will have to be replaced, and um, I think the job like the, the the creative part like creative part of imagining the five years out is how fast these models evolve. Um, and that, you know, if you asked me this question a year ago, I would be much more confident giving you an answer than I am n now, um, this point in time. But I do think that there are, you know, I try to think of from an opportunity perspective, and, and, and then there are some, you know, ethics obviously are, are quite important. So there will be, you know, quality is quite important. Uh, curation is quite important. So I, I think jobs that are related to that, that sort of control, curate, educate, um, AI and these models uh, to do the right, the right thing or the right job in the right way um, will be created and the skills that go with it um, will be important for all of us to develop. But one, one that I was thinking, like very small sort of job that I was thinking about, it's not so easy even today to, there's becoming increasingly amount of, like more science around how to design a prompt. <laughs> Good prompt. Uh, everybody can just put a question and give a task. How to do it in a way that gets you the results you want in the least amount of time, it's not so easy, right? So I could imagine a prompt architect or prompt designer, however you call the role, to actually be quite um, quite needed in a very, very near future, if not now. One thing about, about this will be that it will boil down a lot to communication. Yeah. on human, Whether it's human communication, human-machine communication, uh, this prompt engineer, the prompt designer, prompt architect. It's a lot about experimenting with different things on how does the other side, the receiver of my message, best understands me. Absolutely. And and the other part is, I think, super important is ethics, right? Like knowing that this is, you know, what, what Marcel was talking about, biases. Like how do we, how do we train it? How do we, because it's our responsibility. It's not that AI will take our job. It's the uh, AI will take our job if we let it. Um, and so I think the, 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 the power is in our hands if we want it, um, but we actually have to, have to be responsible about it. Okay, so more AI specialists, prompt designers for every company and head of AI ethics for every company. Cool. Sure. So, <laughs> and, and Marcel, what, what would you like to add to this? Yeah, I mean, many things have been said already. All is um, really good points. Um, I do believe as well it's going to be commodity. We're going to use it day to day. I mean, in fact, we do it already. Um, I think also that um, the prompt engineering is an interesting point because it might train us to ask better questions, to consider context and these things. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, what I'm missing so far from AI is that um, it's um, not really asking questions back. So it's kind of like, you know, um, just assuming that it understood the question and then it goes with it. And to give an example, I was recently um, reached out to by a person from my network who writes an MBA thesis right now, and he asked me, hey, Marcel, um, I'm a bit stuck on that, so can you help me? Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I did, and I, you know, he presented me what he said, and the first thing that he said was actually, I'm, I'm so happy that we live in an age of chat GPT because otherwise I wouldn't have time at all to write this stuff. So he basically said parts, the content parts of what he has written so far are from chat GPT. And he even said, it's cool that I even can give it my style of writing, right? I mean, it even feels like it's from his, uh, from his own. But, well, after him presenting what he has so far, my first question was a question, right? And the question was basically, what, what is the overlying question that you try to answer? 
And that got him thinking. Like, you know, that's basically, like, oh yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> there were basically, we found out later that it was two questions that he tried to answer. And they were kind of like just all over the place. And um, it felt a bit like, um, you know, smartly written, um, rightfully placed content snippets um, that were just like pieced together somehow. So I think that's a component that is still uh, missing in AI. It is like, you know, able to um, have a dialogue about it. But on the other hand, I also don't know where exponential growth will lead us in five years. So it might well be that next year it can do this already. So it's really hard. Um, one thing I believe that it will um, not get soon is the um, point of, you know, soft skills, empathy, trust, you know, all of these things. I think all of these points where these skills are needed, um, AI uh, will not uh, will not be able to go into soon. And I think this is um, also a skill set which will require us to be better in, in the future. Yeah, well... It's it's like it's really hard to predict, you know, because it's it's moving so fast. And I think the jobs I thought one month back that I don't need a freelancer for, now, uh, no, I need a freelancer for, I don't need it anymore. So it's really uh, moving very fast. Um, I think another question is that I think 70% of people here are using ChatGPT or I don't know, some form of AI tools every day. So what is it that as users we should keep in mind when we are using an AI tool for, let's say, very critical questions, solving a maths problem or making my household budget or giving me a diet plan for uh, this week, you know? So, so what are your, what is, as AI, uh, as being in the field of AI, what do you think are some of the things we should consider while, while using AI? Uh, yeah, one thing I hope no one here takes is uh, health or financial advice currently from large language models from ChatGPT. Um, as a society, we got much better. Uh, when when it began in December, January, I saw TikTok, Instagram videos of people who tell you this is how you can, uh, can earn 10K a month with ChatGPT trades. Uh, I saw extreme cases where people were writing tons of female or women health uh, product descriptions which were completely bonkers um, and basically tried to sell their products uh, for their financial profit, basically. Um, and there's a few limitations which we should all always think about. Um, he already mentioned just before that there's an overconfidence now in AI or any type of large language models. You can ask it whatever, and your, pro your prompt, your instruction, uh, it will somehow find uh, good reasoning behind it or make it sound extremely confident, uh, which might persuade you. Uh, I've also had a discussion with somebody on LinkedIn who built a fact checker based on GPT-3. Uh, basically asking, was Barack Obama ever in the White House? So yes, yeah, certainly it will auto complete yes because it has enough information. I countered that person asking, have you ever tried to fact check yourself whether you work at that Web3 company and product? Yeah, it produced saying like, hey, no, uh, that person is working as a journalist at Cointelegraph. And then also she realized, oh, I need to be extremely careful with what I built here. So yeah, for, certainly from you, from the user perspective, AI hallucination is something you need to be always careful with. Uh, take everything with a grain of salt, just like in human communication, uh, critical thinking. Uh, don't believe everything somebody tries to sell to you or tell you. Uh, same goes for AI. In particular, in the next uh, in the next years, we will have several different type of models you will use in different types of products which all will have some, almost you can say, like some, some sort of culture to it. Yeah, they, and you can already see, uh, you see sovereign uh, movements, yeah, certainly OpenAI sits in America, definitely follows American values. Uh, you now see in the EU as well, in France there's a lot of, a lot of things that are happening. We are one of the German players together with Aleph Alpha, Saudi Arabia is putting 40 million into building large language models according to their culture, according to their language as well, right? because all of our culture and our beliefs are mostly also encoded in language. Uh, but I want to give others also the space <laughs> to talk a bit. <laughs> I don't want it always Marcel to go last. Little Marcel, if you want to go. You, fall, you first, then Marcel. <laughs> OK. Um, well, um, I think one other danger is just to assume. Well, I think a danger is going to be for juniors, you know, like basically assuming that they don't need to learn anymore now. Because I think this is an absolute trap and really risky for humanity. Like, 
Um, yes, it's nice that they can, you know, write simple code. Or, yes, that's can write that they can write a bit, little bit of a thesis or anything like that or a bit of content, you know. But I think it is um, essential, nevertheless, you know, to learn these skills and to really understand, you know, why is this the right answer? Not just to pick the right answer, but also to not lose this ability. Because if we lose that, it's an amputation, right, of, of that skill and then become blind. So I think this is really important, especially for the younger people who still go to school, who, I mean, you know, I went to school when Wikipedia was just being launched, you know, it's like, oh, wow, like what's now all possible. But now imagine you go to school now. I mean, you don't need to go to school anymore, right? Because the answers are all there. So I think this is really a risk and we need to keep an eye on that, that we don't uh, lose the ability to think about things ourselves. What is the name of that movie again? Stupidity from the early 2000s, where society yes. is streamlining itself to a degree where nobody wants to do critical thinking anymore. Well, that's one exactly. critical skill we, we shouldn't we shouldn't we shouldn't lose. Yeah, I would also say critical thinking, mostly because, to be honest, it's very scary to think five years from now how many of us will be able to discern reality from non-reality, from sort of what's true, what's not. Because if you look at, even if you look at the generative image sort of uh, creation um, engines, it's sometimes very difficult to say, um, is this a real picture or is this, or is this, or is this compo composure of you know, five different people? Um, and and f I completely agree with Marcel, for, especially for young people, that is very, very difficult, I think, I'm expecting, I'm expecting a child and it scares me. Like how will I, like, yes, you said kids in school, but imagine five years from now, like what is, this, what will be the content then? How, how will I teach this little person? Like what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's not? Um, that, that's, and I think it's similar as, uh, you know, Phone, mobile, mobile phones took some abilities from us. Like how many of us can recall phone numbers to our friends, even family? Not many, right? So it's very easy. I mean, human, human, humans are lazy in nature, right? So we'll, we'll, do, we'll take the shortcuts. So I think the critical thinking is really something that we need to nurture um, because that's the only thing that could actually give us control in shaping AI in a way uh, that will be positive for the society. Also, just to add one thing, I think it's not only young people. Uh, I mean, my mother is 70 years old. She got recently scammed by somebody who wrote her WhatsApp message. Um, who here has seen that viral Drake song, which isn't Drake? Yeah. But sounds like him? No? Yes, yes. Um, and in the U US, it's already uh, an established scam. Yeah, people call you uh, or you get some phone call uh, from your daughter, for example, saying like, there's somebody trying to hurt me. Yeah, uh, you need to pay this amount of money now somewhere. Uh, and that's where also the, in particular, this, 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 the customization of audio uh, needs to find somewhere some sort of, sort of regulation because for many people, they will not see the boundaries if you are not raised in that technology. I think younger ones will very, very quickly adapt. Just like for me, it was the internet and the smartphone. Uh, if somehow I'm lucky to also get getting into the 30s. I'm now with AI deeply enough. Um, but yeah, for the for the elderly ones who do not understand that speed, that something can sound like my my daughter, my my son, my fiance, maybe um, could be potentially in danger. Yeah, that's yeah. where I put trust in. That's that's actually one of the scariest parts of uh, of AI. Um, how many of you have, have questions? I just want to have a sense of show of hands so that we accordingly plan the panel. Okay, good to know. So one question uh, is also again an open sort of question, is that teams and companies and people are really scared right now in terms of what, because layoffs are happening and People are losing jobs, and on top of that, you have AI on recession. And as uh, team leaders, managers, founders of organizations, how can you streamline the use of AI better for employees? Love to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, I don't know if it's about streamlining. I think it's about listening to your employees because everybody is a expert in their own domain, um, and it's it's worth sort of 
seeing and listening how they would use it, how they would make more effective decisions, how they could um, make, make their work more efficient. But I think it's, I think the role of, of emplo employers is to invest in upskilling um, and reskilling um, they, they, they workforce. I mean, in general, I think that's a huge opportunity in, ge in general, right? Because we cannot just allow for these people to not be employed. Um, so I think as an employer, you have sort of responsibility to look ahead of time and think of, okay, which, which processes can I automate? And what that means in terms of added capacity and how these people that I have, what do they need to learn in order to, you know, help help us cover that capacity? So I think reskilling um, and really retraining is is a key part of employers' re uh, responsibility. I, I think before you answer, that's really a good point. But I'll just add one more layer on this question: is that. You know, we also saw in the audience some people don't use AI. I don't know what's the reason. Ethically, they don't want to use it. They are not open to it, or they think they 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 don't need to. So you'll also have those kind of employees in your organization. So is AI going to become something that you definitely need to use to be a part of a company, like sort of? Because I'm asked this question in some job interviews that I'm giving now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's similar to whether in like. 20, 30 years ago, you would have asked somebody, are you using a calculator or a personal computer to do your job? I mean, certainly you could send post around. I just picked up four letters here today in factory, uh, which you know I would love to simply send an email or receive by email because then I could have, have them everywhere. So I think uh, many of these tools which are built now will be become part of our daily operations, more or less. So. Similar to the computer, it's a different type of interface. Uh, we also put our 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 software and our product now. We want to become a virtual twin of somebody. Yeah, think about a virtual co-working next to you. I I've, I've, I tested the first betas now where I put down my background. Yeah, being raised on German fund fairs, venture capital, etc. etc. Et plus my eight values, and uh, it's crazy how similar the responses get to what I would usually tell if a founder asks me for advice on how to raise venture capital. Uh, I would always tell them, first think about which value are you creating. Yeah, Just don't raise for the sake of raising. But I'm drifting off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds good. And Marcel, what do you think about uh, how teams are going to function with AI and how organizations are going to function? Yeah, it's a multi-level question. I think um, as a as a company, you need to um, be open to this innovation as you have been in the past as well, right? I believe um, that's true what has been said already. And I think um, you should, in this regard, also listen to your um, employees, right? Be uh, incentivize them to be open to innovation. And because as an as a company, you need to have, you basically have two responsibilities, right? The one is basically um, to survive as a company, which means on like, you know, create revenue and, um, you know, be able to um, afford the employees that you have. And the second is the social component where you basically need to care for your employees, right? So I think this needs to be an open, uh, open dialogue. Um, and yeah, I think that would be my answer. But then you added another component, component, which is the current phase of like, you know, recession, layoffs and so on. Um, which is true, it's a bit of a difficult combination, right? Because it is. it would be easy to say, okay, I can afford to reduce some people because there is AI, which I believe that would be a big mistake to make. Yeah, I think this is, uh, AI is not there yet. We don't understand uh, what is what is the intelligence of that system. You know, we don't understand if it's just smart copy and pasting Wikipedia articles or the whole internet, um, or is it really understanding? I mean, there's some signs that it really understands, but there are some complete flaws, like where we think like, okay, it's understanding nothing. So I think um, we just need to open to it as, at this point. You know, it's a bit like an um, iPhone moment. Yeah, it has been out now. Everyone is aware, and it's it's fantastic. Um, but we don't know where we to go. And I think openness is what we should have right now. Yeah. I have, I have one you thing. Have thirty seconds. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, I have an example. I have an example of a company who already does a great job implementing yeah. that into their organization. It's a large uh, American investment bank. And they reached out to us because we made a lot of content around people with dyslexia, for example, neurodivergent uh, conditions. I mean, for example, dyslexia, roughly 10% of the population is having uh, those difficulties. Uh, also, ADHD uh, belongs under, under neurodivergence as well. 
And what they want to do is roll out our software now with people with neurodivergent conditions to help them write emails. I mean, I also have troubles concentrating if I'm not writing. Uh, I, I try to write down as much as possible, try to structure my thoughts. And that's also where our software helps me a lot in, for example, responding to our customers. Uh, write my own emails as well, or if I'm writing some content around us, a script for our videos, just bring them on the point. So that's, I believe, what organizations should also look for. And there's a, we've now located around 30, 30 companies so far around the globe, very big corporations who have such initiatives helping people with ADHD, with dyslexia, dysgraphia, etc. The potential is immense. And on that note, just one word each. The future of AI is dash. <laughs> Collaborative. Opportunity. Marcel. Here. <laughs> here. <laughs> here. <laughs> right here at Factory Berlin. Uh, so sh I think we are opening the house of house. OK, so you're going to do that. OK. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? They want to search the floor? In your opinion, is regulation coming? And if so, what form will it take or should it take? I mean, in the EU, definitely regulation is coming. There's the AI, AI Act now being discussed. Uh, the question is, do we want to bring us backwards? That's a typical question about the new technology. Do we want to uh, regulate it to death already in our continent? Will we ever have a chance to it? Um, what currently is, and also the US is now looking into inviting the CEOs of Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, and Anthropic, uh, talking about data privacy. I mean, Italy really kicked something off there. Um, being concerned about what happens with data and uh, there, there can be a whole different type of level and game being spun out of copyright. I believe that, uh, not I believe, GPT-4 was trained on a lot of training material, for example. Uh, everybody was raving on ChatGPT being very capable in scoring through the bar exam. So you basically force bias the machinery to also become better in answering those questions and bring it more logic into it. The question is, should that also have happened? Now we have an extremely capable system out there, and there were definitely some rules maybe broke, uh, might have been broken. Uh, are we mad about that? Uh, question mark. I don't. I don't fear that it's coming anytime soon. <laughs> and I think that 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 is um, yes. Of course, there there is a lot of risk sort of in over regulating and stopping innovation. In on the other hand. The regulatory bodies haven't been historically the most progressive. And when you think about how fast technology is evolving, I just don't think that we can, like if you are that type of person that relies or hopes that reg regulation will help us um, sort of or, or provide us more security, I think that's, that's not um, that sort of fake sense of security. I think there needs to they need to be involved and they will be, but I just don't think they will move fast enough. So I think the sort of on the, the responsibility is on us, each indiv individual, but also I think this private uh, consor consortia um, hopefully will 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 lead us into the right direction. Right? It's it's a little bit um, yeah, it's a bit questionable at the moment. So the topic of deepfakes, for example, is a question mark for the last how six, seven, eight years. Uh, there's no regulation boundary, and you know, faking a video was with human labor was already capable. Now with Midjourney and what Runway is doing, it's maybe even a little bit faster. Maybe somebody in the regulative space is waking them up in, in, the, in these regards. Would you like to add something, Marcel, or we move? No, let's rather go to another question. Okay. So everything. Thanks. Hi, um, so my question, taking maybe ChatGPT as an example of what's current, when prompted it can generate a text. What do you think in terms of how close or how far is artificial intelligence from being able to negotiate, right? Give a response, maybe in recruiting it's uh, offer counter offer on salary or in pharma it's uh, distribution contracts or something like that. How close or how far are we away? I think negotiate close. How well? 
it will negotiate and how critically it will negotiate, I think that that that's much farther. But to be honest, I I, can't, I don't think I'm comfortable putting a timeline on it. I mean, you can in, within the prompt of a of a large language model, you could say what your goal is. For example, my goal is to have um, I don't know a product manager at uh, fifty thousand euros annually. Uh, this is my goal, where I want to be. You might be allowed to go ten to twenty percent up, yeah, in those negotiations. And I think it would already do a pretty good job. At least that's what I have now learned from our from our customizations so far of the model. Yeah, the example I gave with my virtual twin, so to say, and how similar it has become to me. If I would say that I only do deals of a size of a hundred thousand euros, for example then it would also take that as a bias and say like, okay, this is you know who I am. Uh, I just want to have, this is my number, so please uh, adhere to that and I will negotiate around this. I mean, it depends of w what type of negotiation in what type of topic and how much data is around that topic, right? Uh, if it's, a, if it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lot of data and it covers the, that domain quite well, that will be much faster and much better, uh, but there are still quite a quite quite a few areas where they're too niche and too specialized um, for it to be reliable anytime soon. Would you like to add something? <laughs> yeah, many things are said. Like I think it's the capabilities are there. Um, I think it's about just training them. Um, I saw that um, OpenAI has also now like you know kind of like a, a plug and drop down where you basically can already like specialize the tasks that you're doing. I think it's going to come very soon. And the question is, yeah, as has been said before, how well is it going to do the job? Mm, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? Hello, thank you. Um, very interesting panel and good discussions. Um, I have a specific question about the mass societal change uh, this might cause, and uh, especially in the fact that a lot of larger companies are holding hires and new companies are looking at more being more effic efficient, uh, specifically based on the profit-based model of running private businesses. What kind of uh, changes need to be made by private corporations, but also the public sector, to make sure this transition is as safe and smooth as possible. Uh, what are you envisioning in that regard? Um, yeah. That's a deep one. <laughs> I mean, I take the bullet first. Um, there's a really great video now from Economics Explained Out, where he also discusses those topics a lot. I mean, basically what could be that uh, universal basic income would be great. Where, and, and now I'm talking like 10 to 20 years, how our society might look like. Big corporations are taxed on machinery and basically their product, product productivity output more reliable than it is today, let's say it like this, even though you have this hazard of where would then organizations sit and that would pay for uh, yeah such a basic universal income. Uh, that could be one of the solutions, uh, but I still think that we all seek purpose in life as a human being, or most of us. Um, therefore, we will try our best to be a productive member of the society. Even if you are uh, an extreme creative, what we will see, or I, I, I take a lot of dynamics out of the social media bubbles. Yeah? A lot of our thinking is already uh, compromised to bubbles. Yeah? Depending where you are, you most likely are categorized somewhere. Uh, now we will have even more of that with productivity, so originality will be become even more important and you will be, look at yeah, TikTok for example, uh, if we now type in what you can do with ChatGPT, there will be thousands of videos which all look the same. Uh, Twitter is full of posts of, uh, hey, in the last six weeks this is how GPT-4 has changed society, they all look the same, where's the originality? So I think to come back to your question yet again, uh, we all strive for purpose. We will all have some sort of productivity uh, which we can contribute to community and society. And we should, that should be also our individual responsibility to feel like this. I think education also is a big part of what they really need to do more of and, and better and more broadly because I think there is I mean, I think in this room, you're all here because you're interested in a topic and you know quite a bit about it. 
um, but we in this 1%, right? And it's not just um, the young, not just the kids, and not just the older who are uh, marginalized. It's also the ones that don't even have access to to, to tools, to information, to, to systems, and so forth. And so um, it is a responsibility of these companies to educate and sort of also be in some way honest. So I think, you know, what we talked about before misinformation or sort of discerning the reality from or true or not. I think it is up to them and the designers and the engineers to display information in a way that at the end you give the information that is needed, but you highlight so the decision can be then left to the human being to judge if it's right or not. Uh, and not for that human to have to, you know, work very hard to discern what's 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 right or not. Um, so I think there's a lot of responsibility on 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 them, and partially I think is it is ed education um, and bringing sort of highlighting what what they're doing and how they're doing it. I know for a fact from from my field because we work with scientists, uh, scientists are largely skeptics in general. Um, and so they will not trust the system and they will question everything, right? And I think um, that we, we can learn, we can all learn from, from that. Um, and the, the companies that are, the more, the more companies are questioned, uh, the more they, the better they will be in sort of in showing the, the right, right side of things. Yeah, to maybe add one more point, I think in order, the question was like how to order, uh, roll it out smoothly. I think um, one thing that should be noted here, which is already like good and smooth, is the openness of how it's being rolled out. I mean, imagine, I mean, I'm sure that there are AI models out there that are not as public as OpenAI does it, right? And that, I think, is a danger. But um, I think it's fantastic of how open source and how, um, or sometimes closed source, but at least open community, um, these uh, developments are which has not been the case um, in the past, you know, like um, there everything was behind closed doors if you think of technology advancements. Um, so this is the first time where it feels like, okay, humanity is actually working together on this, uh, which is also, I think, a good trend. Yeah, that's, that's actually a very positive note to end on. Humanity is working together uh, with AI. And um, on that note, I would really like to thank all the panelists for joining this discussion, all the audience who are there and listening to us and asking questions, Factory Berlin for hosting this panel and giving us the chance to speak and the great supportive team here. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And I'll give it to you for you. Awesome. Yeah, there will be some drinks um, in the cinema bar. Thank you so much, everyone, for a great panel. Have a lovely evening. Enjoy the rest of the sunshine. Thank you.